Well, thanks. I did come down from Minneapolis last night, and uh, when I got here after my long drive, I left my office a lot later than I was expecting. And when I got to the union last night and got into my room and saw the On Wisconsin pillows and the Badger seal, I was like, oh, this will be the best sleep ever. <laughs> so I was excited. It's so nice to be back. Thank you for having me. It is really um, fun, too, to reflect on this work as it relates to um, what I learned here and what I brought forward to Minnesota and what sort of culminated in a, in a program of research that I'm really excited to share with you. So I remember distinctly the first time that I went to the women's prison and I was there observing this pregnancy and parenting group that is run by a nonprofit organization. Um, and I was there just to sort of learn and observe. And I was sitting there and the group facilitator said, to the group of women, what's your biggest fear about being a parent? This was sort of the check-in for the day. And we kind of went around the table, and we got to the last woman, and she was probably seven or eight months pregnant, visibly pregnant, looking very, very tired. And she said, my biggest fear about being a parent is that I'm going to be no better to my baby than my mama was to me. And the group facilitator very delicately probed, and she said, so how are you doing with that? And the mom said, you know, honestly, I'm not sure. I'm pregnant and in prison, but I'm not beating my baby. So which is worse, right? And for me, this was this moment of it sort of encapsulated everything that we had learned, I had learned about attachment theory, intergenerational patterns of parenting, and abuse and neglect, and the ways in which this woman's trauma from childhood was really carried forward into her own adult trajectory, but also the way she was thinking about parenting her own child, right? And for me, it was this profound moment of thinking, I'm totally in the right place. I need to be exactly in this seat today, and I suspect I'm going to be at this prison for many, many, many more times to come. So. I suspect that this is not, for those of you who are in Julie's class or who have heard Julie speak or are aware of what's happening with incarceration in, this, in the country, what we know, right, is that between 1991 and mid-year 2007, the number of children with a mother in prison went up 131%. And we can look, there are you know, similar inclines, increases with um, children with a father in prison, but not as drastic, about 77% increase during that period of time. We know that um, estimates, national estimates, suggest that about half of men in state prisons are fathers, and more than 60% of women in state facilities are mothers. We've actually just recently done some analyses with um, men and women in our state prisons, and those numbers suggest that as high as 75 and 85% of men and women, respectively, are parents of minor children. So these are national estimates um, and are probably severe underestimates of what we know about the size of this population and the impact of incarceration on the next generation. So what do we know about Minnesota, which is where I do my work? Um, in mid-year 2012, there were about 660 incarcerated women there. Um, in Wisconsin, you have a larger prison population. We have um, far more people, though, on probation and on parole, which is important to think about when you consider the consequences of sort of being incarcerated and then getting out and what that means for the family system. But when we consider the population of women that we're serving in Minnesota, it, it hovers right around 650 to 675 women. Um, and no surprise, it is a generally disadvantaged population of women. We see that. At the one women's prison in Minnesota, at Minnesota Correctional Facility Shakopee, the average age of women there is about 36 years old. And you can see that there is a disproportionate representative of groups of uh, American Indian and African American women. Um, and this will be important because we'll come back to these uh, demographic characteristics when we think about the population of women that our program is actually serving. So although you still see about 60% of women who are white here, we actually, our population of women is even more diverse than this when we look at the, the population we're serving. Um, and you can see that about 73% have a diploma or GED. Um, here, the, the breakdown by offense type and the population that we're serving of women. And if you are following sort of the, the mass incarceration of men and women in this country and what we're knowing about women who are going to prison, we see women in our group ranging from, you know, they're in for, some of them are in for check, check fraud. Others are in for conspiracy charges. So lots of women are in for conspiracy charges, meaning that their boyfriend or their partner or somebody in their household was engaged in uh, criminal activity and they should have known or maybe they did know and therefore were party to that crime or are coming into the facility um, because of some 
related role to that incarcer to the, their partner's incarceration. And so this is really complex when you think about the women who are coming into our group and the reasons why they're there and the reasons why they may be separated from their children. When we think about incarcerated women in general, we know that 75% of them, at least 75% of them, are of childbearing age. 61%, as I had said earlier, are mothers. And it's estimated that about 3 to 4% are pregnant at admissions. Those numbers have ranged. There are not good estimates on this. This is one of the real challenges in doing this research is that there are no systematic data collection systems for tracking pregnancies when you come in. You would think um, that if women are being tested upon coming into the facility, that those data would be kept and maintained. It's not really the way it happens. And so getting good estimates from our Department of Corrections, even asking them today, hey, how many pregnant women are in the facility today, they don't know, which is really concerning when you've got to think about the fact that there are only 660 women there who in that group are pregnant and what are the services that are, they're getting. And I think one of the things that's most exciting about our work is that some of the research that we've been doing has really illuminated gaps in data collection within the Department of Corrections system and has really driven them to internally change policy to start collecting more data, which as a researcher is really exciting about sort of that feedback loop. Like, we're missing gaps in the research. We're going to keep doing some research. We're going to you know, help you collect more data or learn more, and we'll give that back to you in a way that feels um, really exciting about the work that we're doing. So what do we know about maternal health in the context of incarceration? We know that among, and this is just among um, incarcerated moms in general, that 10% report a period of homelessness in the year before their incarcerations. More than a third report uh, some kind of government transfer, such as welfare or social security payment. Um, and about one in five report income from illegal sources in the period leading up to their incarceration. So this is a high risk group of women, uh, no doubt. We know that their physical health is not good. 50% of moms report a current medical problem. And the mental health is not good either. 73% of moms report a current and ongoing mental health issue. Many of our moms are struggling with chemical health issues. And 64% of them, so again, about two-thirds of them, are reporting some kind of substance abuse or dependence in their history. So all of this creates a complex picture when we think about maternal health. And now you layer on the pregnancy piece, right? And this gets further complicated when you consider uh, being pregnant in the context of your incarceration. So pregnant prison prisoners are at increased risk for poor prenatal outcomes. And they're less likely to receive adequate prenatal care. Uh, we were, I just had come from Julie's class this morning. And we were reflecting on what does the health care look like in a, in a pr state prison. And what we know, and there's been a lot written about the fact that the healthcare system um, in prisons was really built for men by men. And what does that healthcare look like, particularly when you're considering the reproductive health needs of women and those specific health needs of women in a system that is largely dominated by men? Um, even in our women's prison, one of the things that we've really been advocating for is to get a, a female practitioner, to get a female OB gyne a gynecologist. Um, and, Many, you're mostly women. Uh, I think most women would say that seems so obvious when you consider that these women have experienced considerable traumas in their childhood. You know, I was just reflecting this morning, one of the women in our group was pregnant for the first time at 14 after she was raped by her father. Another woman was pregnant in our group uh, having been gang raped. And when you consider the trauma that many of these women have experienced and then layering on a correctional system where the health care is really not gender specific and, and isn't in tune to what those women need in their trauma histories, you could imagine that this incarceration during pregnancy might exacerbate their risks or their poor outcomes. That said, uh, some pregnant women, when we look at community comparisons, some pregnant women in prison do better than what they than community comparisons if they were out in the community, right? So this may be due at least in part to the fact that they, as we were talking about this morning, they have a roof over their head, they may be protected from abusive partners, they may not be using. And we've heard women in our group say, I had to hit rock bottom. If I was still out, if I hadn't become incarcerated, I would still be using. And I really needed to come here in order to get on the right trajectory. Um, 
But we know, right, that the birth outcomes in the small number of studies that have looked at women's health in the context of incarceration, they don't look good, but we also know that women were coming from these very stressed environments in advance, before their incarceration, and that whether it was the substance use or the toxic stress or the exposure to violence or the homelessness, that all of those things would be risk factors for poor outcomes during their pregnancies. So this is a complicated issue, as you can imagine. So, Recognizing all of these complexities and the needs of pregnant women, uh, my colleague Erica Garrity, and you'll see her in one of the videos that I'll um, show in a bit here, uh, Erica was an intern, a graduate intern, um, doing her social work rotation at the women's prison um, many, many years ago. And what she noticed was an absolute lack of care and consideration for the pregnant women at that facility. Uh, she said she would see pregnant women in the yard. She would see them. They looked sad. They looked lost. There was no opportunity for them to connect with each other. The pregnant women were sort of scattered all across the facility. And if you, know, you were housed in one living unit and you were pregnant and you saw another pregnant woman, you might want to connect with her. But the prison rules were such that they really had no opportunities for interacting, right? So there was no social support. Uh, there was no opportunity for education. These women weren't getting specialized prenatal education or even really prenatal care that was specific to their needs. And Erica said, there's got to be a better way for us to do this. And so out of her experiences and her observations as a licensed clinical social worker, she started ISIS Rising. And I have to pause here and say the name has preceded the terrorist group. It has now become a very unfortunate name. Um, we have contemplated now for about the last six to nine months, like, got to change the name, particularly when people capitalize the first four letters. Um, Isis is the goddess of fertility and motherhood. And Erica, many years ago, now probably 10 years ago, was contemplating the name of this group, right? And she was thinking, God, I really want it to be something empowering. I want it to be something that really speaks to motherhood in a positive way. And she was struggling with what the name of this group might be. And she was having an informal talking circle at the prison. And a woman walked in, and she had this giant tattoo on her arm. And it said, Isis Rising. And Erica said, that's the name of our group. It's got to be. It makes, this is it, right? Now, fast forward 10 years, not so good. Um, so we're, we're contemplating what happens with our, our project name. So the project has two key components, and I'm going to share a little bit uh, with you about kind of both of these elements and outcomes and what we're doing from an evaluation science side for both of these. Um, so the two components are this new moms group and the doula program. So we offer basically a pregnancy and parenting support program at the women's prison in Shakopee. And women who are, have children under the age of five are referred by their case manager or are currently pregnant. Um, and their participation in the program is voluntary. And all of the research that I'll tell you about is their participation in that is, of course, voluntary as well. I will say that as we move through outcomes and we talk about this, the science side of all of this, we haven't had a single woman turn down having a doula um, or accessing birth support. We also haven't had a single woman say, I want the service, but I don't want to participate in the research. Uh, being a part of this research project seems to be a very empowering experience for these women. Um, they feel like through the research, they are getting a collective voice in a way that I think is really exciting. Um, I think about all of the community-engaged research that I do, and I think about principles of community-based participatory research, and all of those principles are really challenged when you go into a system where power structures are what they are in a correctional facility, and the idea of collectively working together on a, on a shared project becomes very complicated. And so all of the women have wanted to participate in the program and in the research. And that is something that we're excited about from a feasibility and implementation standpoint. So the new moms group uh, is a weekly two hour session. It's taught on 12 week group sessions. So we run them like in qu quarters basically. And that's the way the educational system within the, um, the prison is set up. So there might be you know 12 weeks of an edu education class like a GED or religious programming or some kind of supplemental program. Um, and so our program is, is infused in that those offerings. Um, it's taught year round and facilitated by Erica or my program coordinator, Ray Baker, or a variety of doulas um, or practitioners that are working in the community. Right now, we've actually been utilizing a paired model where we have um, a social work intern who is there as the second person, which is a really great training opportunity, too. The goals of the curriculum are, are really to increase women's knowledge about reproductive health and the physiology 
of pregnancy and birth, to increase their tangible parenting skills and their life skills. So really to think about not just how is your body changing with pregnancy, what is it gonna be like to be a parent, what are some of the things that you need to think about with the co-parenting relationship, but then also to increase women's support from their peers and the professional staff within our program. We really try to do this in a couple of ways. Every week we try to introduce an educational component so it's not just education, right? It's not just this is how you know your, your body is physically changing during pregnancy. It's really about we introduce that educational topic um, and then we try to create a warm and nurturing space where we model empathy but also encourage accountability, helping women understand their own uh, piece of, of this puzzle explaining the issue of empowerment and helping empower women to make healthy choices in their pregnancy. So if they're coming in you know, saying, well, I'm not being seen, and you know, that correctional officer was nasty to me, and I've kited medical six times, and I still haven't been seen, we really help women reframe that and think about, well, OK, what, can, what are the other strategies that you can take? So you've kited medical, so that's a prison, a prison letter sending through the system. What are other ways? Could you use you know, the parenting coordinator as an advocate? Could you kite somebody else and go up the chain of command? What were your interactions with that correctional officer like, and how can we reframe that? So again, trying to really model um, empathy and accountability, but also helping those women um, feel empowered to get the care that they should be getting, which is complicated in this system. And then the second part of the program, which is often what really gets talked about with our program, is this doula component. So pregnant women are matched with a doula uh, who is a trained professional. She provides physical, emotional, and informational support to the mother before, during, and after her birth. And what we know about doula support, right, is that in previous reviews of doula support, we know that women who receive continu continuous intrapartum support, they have shorter labors, they're more likely to have spontaneous vaginal deliveries, and this becomes important when we think about the costs of birth and labor and delivery. Um, and they're less likely to re report dissatisfaction with their birth experience. And so those are data you know, that aren't with pregnant women in prison, but when we think about the literature on doula support and birth support in general, this seems like it could be a good model for a high-risk group of women in this setting, particularly given that these women would otherwise have no support, right? So given their increased risk, doula care, so we thought, might be a promising um, pro approach for this group of women. And so what our doulas do is they provide, as I said, prenatal support. So the, the doulas meet with the mother once per month or at least twice leading up to the woman's uh, delivery. This gets complicated, as you can imagine, because women are coming into the facility at various stages in their pregnancy. So they may come in and they may be in their first month of pregnancy and we can get several prenatal visits in with that woman. Or she may come in eight months pregnant and we might be able to get one or maybe one visit in before she's ready to deliver. Um, these meetings, and we'll talk about this a little bit more as I move through, but these meetings really include prenatal education, so one-on-one. -on -one, these women are also in the group and getting the peer support in the education. But now with the doula, the woman is getting prenatal education, emotional support, and assistance with preparing her birth plan. When the woman goes into labor, she's transferred to the local hospital. At uh, the Minnesota Correctional Facility Shakopee, there is a local hospital where the woman will be seen um, at 32 weeks and after, and that's where she's transferred for her labor and delivery. And so what happens is um, she may start showing signs of of labor and the doula, the watch commander calls the doula and the doula drives down from the Twin Cities area, which is about a 30 minute drive unless it's snowing, in which case it's a two and a half hour drive. Um, and the doula is there to provide continuous labor and delivery support. So she provides emotional support, helps with physical comfort. She assists the mom in making informed decisions during the labor and delivery. Uh, she can do a lot of the things that traditional doulas would do in that setting, right? She can reposition the mom on, a, on an exercise ball. She can help the mom in the shower. She could use aids that traditional doulas in a community setting would be able to use. And then she provides post-birth and postpartum support. So the doula is there, um, like I said, to provide continuous labor and delivery support. But then 
About 48 hours after that woman delivers her baby, she's going to be separated from the baby. Um, if she's had a, a typical vaginal delivery, the standard discharge is right around two days. And so the doula then comes back when she knows that mom is going to be discharged, and she provides support in sometimes the, the moments or the hours leading up to that mom being separated. And so you'll hear a little bit about what that looks like. Um, but this is a really, really difficult time for both the mom and the doula, right? That mom can't have any contact with the person who is coming to pick up her baby. So there might be husband or boyfriend or grandma out in the lobby of the hospital. And the nurse is going to take that baby from that mom and wheel the baby down the hall. And the mom is now alone going back to the prison. And so the doula is there to provide a really critical role in emotional support for that woman and help um, coach her through that. And then that woman goes back to the group, right? And often that's the most probably a really cathartic period of time for that mom because she gets to share her birth experience and really we can frame it in a very positive way. Our doulas are able to take pictures of the birth and so the mom can opt to share those five pictures with the group, which is a really powerful thing. Prior to the implementation of our program, uh, these mom's births were happening and no one was there to witness it. There were no pictures. And I think what's really hard about that is this idea, of, particularly for those first time moms, to have no pictures of the birth of your baby. Um, and so it seems like a little thing, but for these moms to be able to share that in this group setting and to feel really proud about their birth and to feel empowered by that and to see this as a, a really important transition for them in their life course, a moment where they want to make a change, is a really a powerful thing. Um, and then the doula returns and provides postpartum support uh, back at the facility. So she provides um, two postpartum visits. And again, the mom is in the group getting support in that way too. So about two years ago, our local television station um, wanted to do a story on ISIS rising, and we could talk at length or later about the challenges of wanting to share our story and working with the media, um, and working with the media in this context, right? So the correctional facility, the prison isn't like, hey, yeah, come bring your camera, come bring you know, the reporters. It's not usually the way it goes. And we've really had a lot of soul searching to do about how do we tell our story about providing pregnancy and parenting support while also respecting uh, women's privacy and respecting their stories. And Cassie, who was featured um, in this story, was a first time mom and very much wanted to tell the story about her experiences um, leading up to her incarceration and what this experience meant for her. Sorry, I should have brought Kleenex. I see several of you. Um, it's hard to do this work um, in full disclosure and be you know, a dispassionate researcher. I remember one of the, the times I was driving home from the prison after hearing a pretty difficult story. And it wasn't, I only live about 20 minutes north of the prison. And it wasn't until I was almost in my driveway that I realized I had, was just sobbing. Um, it's really difficult work. These women have very difficult um, life histories and the circumstances um, that they're currently in and the families that they're going back to are really complicated as well. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about the program evaluation and the ongoing uh, data collection that we're doing with this program. And as a caveat, I'll say that um, some of the numbers that I'll present are a little bit different uh, than what Boyd Hooper reported in that story, only because they sort of took that snapshot in time. Um, and since then, we've had more data come in, of course. And so those numbers um, have varied a little bit. So what are we doing to sort of understand what this program is doing? The, the human element is clear, but it's the scientist in me says, is it working? What do we know? What are the outcomes that we care about? Um, so we're doing initial and final surveys with the moms in the group. So all of the women who are participating in the group, um, those surveys at the start and at the end of 12 weeks are really looking at physical and mental health, so chronic conditions, depression, um, and experiences with the program. Do they like participating? Do they, are they getting value out of it? Some of the sort of the user satisfaction elements. Um, the doulas complete a post, excuse me, the moms complete a post-birth survey about their perceptions of their labor, birth, and postpartum experiences. Um, and then the doulas report um, a number of things. So they prepare case notes from the birth, uh, which includes information about the mom's birth plan that was leading up to those, those prenatal visits leading up to the, the birth. Um, they include data about the pregnancy and labor and delivery statistics, uh, the length of the labor, interventions used, uh, 
gestational age, birth weight, those kinds of really objective measures, if you will. And then they also prepare a birth and separate, separation narrative. And for those of you who have used doulas or are familiar with this bot model, in the community, this is often referred to as a birth story or maybe referred to as a birth story. And you know, this was something that the doulas were really doing um, at the beginning for themselves to kind of process the birth and then amongst the group of doulas as a support um, and sort of a way for the group of doulas to support each other and ward off some of these secondary trauma issues that many doulas who are doing this work may uh, experience. And so just really helping the, the, the the practitioners process that birth, right? And so the birth and separation narratives, we weren't really necessarily anticipating using as data, but ended up becoming a really valuable source of qualitative data as we've moved through this project. Um, the group, the section up there in purple, the initial and final surveys, I had said at the beginning that we allowed women to participate in the group if they had children under the age of five or were currently pregnant. And initially, we were evaluating all of those women. And the women in the group who weren't pregnant were also doing initial and final surveys. The group has gotten so big, and so many women have wanted to participate with children of a variety of ages that since we've actually split. And we have a new moms group with women who are pregnant and recently postpartum. And then we have a mothering inside group where those moms with older children and, and even those toddlers and school-aged children are participating. And that really is taking a different form. Um, but we're evaluating all of that too. What I'm going to share with you now really is focused on those pregnant women in particular. Between July 2011 and June 2014, we had 39 pregnant women who were matched with a doula. You can see here uh, that the average age was about 20 half, 28 and a half years old. This is substantially lower than the average in the prison, which was 36. And you can see here the, the racial breakdown looks quite different. So versus the 60% of the women at Shakopee that are white, uh, only 36% of our population, um, our sample in the, the program is white. Um, and we serve a pretty sizable percentage of um, Native women, which really, as we look at diverse, diversifying our doulas, really one of the challenges for us is trying to identify Native doulas who want to do this work and who have this experience and who can really be sensitive to the cultural differences um, of a pregnancy and birth for Native women. Um, and you can see there that the average age, uh, the average years of education is comparable to the women at Shakopee. So at the start of the program, just some overview of some characteristics of the women in our group. At the start of the program, most of these women were not first time moms. Actually, of the 39, um, only one or two of them was, was pregnant for the first time. They had served on average about three and a half, 3.3 months of their sentence. And their sentences ranged between two and 62 months. Um, so on average, these women had about a year and a half sentence. Um, and this becomes important when we think about, you heard in, in the news story that Cassie was getting out 16 days after the birth of her baby. Uh, this becomes important, that difference between time of delivery and release from prison for a whole host of reasons, um, including what might be alternatives to incarceration, sort of um, providing these data to think about, well, what else could we do with these moms besides sep separate for them from their babies for those 16 days? If Cassie is going to return and be the primary caregiver for that mom, whether it's six days or 16 days or even six months, does it benefit Cassie and does it benefit that baby to be separated? Um, really then the opportunities to breastfeed um, are zero. Um, the opportunities for moms to maintain their milk supply even when they're going to go back to the prison and be back for a very short period of time are, are none. And so there are really some important implications of just that piece of data about the length of their sentence as it relates to their delivery dates. Um, our group of women is very high risk. Uh, about 80% of them have received some kind of mental health diagnosis. Two thirds of them have experienced some kind of domestic violence. About a fifth of them have some kind of ongoing chronic health condition. And then 18% uh, of them or so have been working with child protection, um, not necessarily with this pregnancy, but have worked with child protection in the past. So what do we know about the group uh, findings and what are, we, are, what are we seeing based on just the group alone, not necessarily thinking about the one-on-one -on -one support? Um, so women who participate in the group at the 12-week follow-up report significantly fewer depressive symptoms. They report more confidence as parents. They report more support from other women at the prison. And really interesting to us is they actually report more support from prison staff. Um, this is something that when we looked at this, we were actually um, 
excited about this finding, this idea, right, that there is something in our group. The prison staff aren't there. The prison staff are supporting our group. They might unlock the room for us. We take the attendance record down to them. But there is something about this idea that we can model a process for these women about effective communication in a, in a really intense hierarchy and power structure that these women do feel like they're getting more support from the prison staff. And it's hard to measure this, right? But there's, it's also possible that our being there has changed the culture of the prison in many ways and that those staff are, in fact, more supportive. It's kind of very hard to know. Uh, one woman said when we asked her, what did you learn from the group? She said, how to relieve stress, discipline my children, get support, ask for help care for my children emotionally and physically. We also know that women report really high levels of satisfaction with their participation in the program and report high levels of support from our staff, which is good, of course. Um, and when we look at more objective measures and thinking about are they getting what we want program from, from a program implementation standpoint, what we know is that the overwhelming majority, about 87% of those moms, are getting those first two visits. Um, again, I said that the timing of their pregnancy can be really challenging when they come into the facility. We've had a couple of moms who have come in right before they're due, and we don't get a chance to meet them before one-on-one uh, -on -one before they deliver. The first prenatal visits, you can see, are last about an hour in length. And the doulas are talking with the clients about coping with their incarceration, emotional changes and stress, um, their birth preferences, and what it's going to be like to give birth in prison. We haven't missed a single birth, uh, which is always challenging when you think about how unpredictable birth can be, and that sometimes that call comes and they say your client's in labor and our doulas have to you know, get on the road very, very quickly to try to get to Shakopee. Um, and you can see that the doulas are staying with their clients at the hospital for about seven and a half hours. And the topics, the most common topics that they're discussing are breastfeeding, birth in prison, birth preferences, and some of the emotional changes and stress that they're experiencing. That separation visit lasts uh, just over three hours, about three and a half hours. And the doulas are really here focused again on coping with incarceration. What is this experience going to be like when you go back and how difficult that is? The emotion cha emotional changes. Some topics about taking care of your body after birth and breastfeeding. And then doing two postpartum visits, which last about an hour. Again, that common theme of really coping with the incarceration and the separation from the baby, um, taking care of your body after birth, and really getting back to exercise. So let's think about some of the birth outcomes. Uh, of those 39, we had 30 five spontaneous vaginal deliveries and only four C-sections. So in the video you heard the C-section rate was at 33%. Uh, the national average for non-incarcerated women does hover right around 33%. Uh, and this becomes important when we think about the cost of these deliveries um, and the risk to mom and baby for unnecessary C-sections. Uh, Erica mentioned in the video, you know, we were hearing in group, anecdotally, women were saying to each other, if you get a choice, you go with that C-section because you get one more day with your baby. And who doesn't want one more day with their baby, right, in this circumstance? It's also really challenging because scheduling a C-section has a lot of advantages from a prison side of things, right? The, the, the staff at the prison then know when they're being transported and when they're going. The woman isn't aware of when that C-section is delivered, uh, uh, scheduled for safety and security reasons. but. For a system that operates on routine and movement and safety, you could see why a C-section, those C-section rates might have been as high as they were um, prior to the implementation of our program. Uh, none of our babies were born preterm, and they were all uh, at gestational age, which is really exciting for us. So no preterm and no low birth weight babies. So lots of healthy babies. And when we think about why does this matter, um, you know, this is where I have to reflect a little bit on sort of my preterm days when I was here at the university working with Julie on the preterm project. Why do we care about preterm birth outcomes? There are long-term consequences for infant health and development and across the life course, really, but they're also very, very costly, right? The difference, the average cost between a full-term and a preterm delivery is about $50,000. And when you're considering the fact that as taxpayers, we're paying for that, uh, that can become a very compelling message for a state department of corrections about the cost of their deliveries, the cost of these births, and how a very modest intervention could potentially improve birth outcomes. 
So one uh, woman wrote, having a doula there made my experience a good one. It helped a lot. You have to find something positive about your birth experience while you're in prison, and my doula helped me achieve that. So I'll pause here for just a second and say, I was excited about these numbers. I felt like, yeah, 10% C-section is good, no preterm, no, no, no low birth weight babies. Uh, but of course, I'm a skeptical scientist, and that's my job, right? And so I said, well, I don't know. These could be just the fact that, again, what we know, those women are protected from abusive partners. They're not using. Maybe the prison's doing a great job with the meals. You know, it could be that this is exactly, this has nothing to do with the doulas, right? And so I have been working very hard over the last year to identify sources of data that we could potentially use as comparison. The challenge is, is that the babies are not the Department of Corrections clients, so very few Department of Corrections, if any, keep these data on birth outcomes because it's irrelevant to them, right? And the overwhelming majority of Department of Corrections across the country are still using paper records. There's no electronic medical record. So this presents lots of challenges if you're looking for comparison data, right? But I started to put out, I have a great collaboration with the Department of, our Department of Corrections, and I said to my colleague Grant Dewey, I said, Grant, I got a problem. I need to find some comparison data. Do you have any suggestions on um, where I might look? And he said, well, I would see if you could find a state that is progressive enough that they're collecting data, but not progressive enough that they've got a doula program. Go. Here's the states I would start with. And I really just started cold calling, cold emailing the directors of research at all of those uh, state prisons um, and landed on Oregon. And I was excited that Oregon had a time period that was very comparable to ours. Uh, they were, had collected some data. The OB uh, guy there had sent me some data. Um, their pregnancies between 2010 and at the time, just the end of 2014. And what you can see is that their um, the number of pregnancies and deliveries with their state are pretty comparable to ours, um, hovering around you know, a, a dozen to two dozen a year. Um, the average age is pretty similar. The C-section rate is astronomical compared to ours, so ranging from 33 to 42%. Uh, not yet enough for me to feel totally convinced. Right now we're working with um, an ob in Ohio. Um, Ohio has a great system where they actually send medical residents in to provide the care, and they're using EPIC because the Ohio State Medical Center is using EPIC. And so we're hoping to find a comparison sample that we can actually look at and hoping that we might be able to, as we move forward, uh, go back through the Department of Corrections records. So this is another way that we're trying to kind of triangulate data, go back back through those paper files, see if we can glean any information from the discharge report about the delivery at minimum so that we can compare the C-section rates for women in the five years prior to the implementation of our program and the five years that we've been providing services and make some comparisons that way. All that is to say that we feel pretty excited about where this is at and yet tentative as we think about um, what are the other sources of data that we want to feel very compelled by this. So more from a qualitative side of things in the, in the last 10 or 15 minutes or so before we take some questions, um, we really have used that one of the papers that we've recently published is looking at um, the doula's roles, utilizing those qualitative birth stories that the doula's prepared. Um, and we did some qualitative analysis of those birth stories and found four common themes, this idea of establishing a trusting relationship. So um, one one doula wrote, you know, she was so happy to see me it made my whole day. The nurse said she did not want to get out of bed or do anything until her doula arrived. Um, and you can see another quote there. Uh, one mom said to the doula, you are a great support and help when there is no family around. And what we know is that establishing this trusting relationship in an environment where there just is inherent lack of trust in the people who work in the system is really critical. And if you've had a doula or you know about doula's roles in the community, you can't really have an impact unless you're really truly establishing a relationship in a relatively short period of time with this woman. And for a, a woman in a correctional facility who, again, may have had a lot of distrust in the system, a lot of distrust of strangers, to be able to find doulas who are able to get to a point where we feel like they're establishing a trusting relationship over that short period of time and can have an impact as an important piece of the puzzle. 
Um, there was a lot of theme, uh, kind of a lot of stories around empowerment. So one doula wrote, she was at nine centimeters and really focusing through the contractions. Soon it came time for pushing. She remained very calm and focused. She had the natural labor she had planned for, although she says it was her longest labor at six hours. Um, this may be the first time that some of our women are delivering sober. And so for them to have an, an, a sober and empowering birth experience can be really transformative. Another doula wrote, things progress quickly after the artificial rupture of membranes. She dilated completely by 10.55 and pushed for 10 minutes. She was in complete control of her body and the pain. I was so impressed by her. There was also the sense of the normalizing the birth in a very atypical environment, right? So when providing care for pregnant incarcerated women, our prison doulas are really encountering a number of issues that they wouldn't otherwise encounter with their community clients. Um, so she's flanked by two correctional officers, there's soft restraint, she knows that the baby is going to be separated. There are all of these elements that make this an atypical or a non-normative birth experience for that doula. Um, but there is this ability for the doula to create some normalcy in this setting. So one doula wrote, I learned from my client that she had arrived at the hospital around 11 a.m. She confessed her frustration to me since she uh, came in with three centimeters dilation and it was 5 p.m. and she was still at three centimeters. We decided to use the ball, a large exercise ball used to increase a woman's flexibility. You've seen them at the gym, I'm sure. Um, she didn't like it very much, and then we tried to go on all fours on the bed. My client did not like being on all fours due to back pain. After a few hours had gone by, we decided to go in the tub. The nurse brought in a lavender inhaler, and my client loved the smell of the sweet, the sweet smell of lavender. Now, if you read this birth story, it wouldn't you would have no idea that this was a woman who was currently incarcerated and that, you know, a day later she'd be separated from her baby and that she would be, you know, put in full restraints to be wheeled out of the hospital. This is something that our doulas can create in this environment that was really not there prior to the implementation of our program. And then really this critical role about the support during separation that is a unique feature of a prison doula project. So one doula wrote, I arrived on the day that my client was to be released back to prison. When I arrived, she was eating breakfast with her baby, snuggled in with her. She told me about the two days she spent with her daughter, hardly putting her down at all. She breastfed the whole time, and the baby was doing very well at latching on. She was terribly sad that the baby would have to switch to formula. Her mom was set to come at 10 a.m. to pick the baby up. She was very sad, but was also feeling happy that her mom would be able to bring the baby to visit often. She ended up getting to spend a good part of the day cuddling her baby. She changed back into the clothes she came in the hospital in and got ready to be shackled for the ride back to prison. I asked that they bring a wheelchair in, and I grabbed a blanket out of the closet. Once she was shackled and sitting in the wheelchair, I put the blanket over her lap. I picked up the baby and held her up to my client's face so she could kiss her. My client quietly cried. The officer started to push her out into the hallway. The nurse walked al alongside her, pushing the baby bassinet all the way up to the door. The nurse then picked up the baby for one last kiss. And another doula wrote, it was time to say goodbye. By then, the baby was back um, from being taken to the visiting room and was being held by my client. She started sobbing. She covered her face with the blanket. She got dressed, and the shackles were placed on her wrists, feet, and a chain around her waist. She was wheeled out of the hospital and back to the facility. She cried all the way until she got to the van, and I could not be a witness to her tears anymore. I think we have seen that one of the biggest challenges in implementing this program is really providing support to these doulas in a role that they otherwise have no training for, right? It's unnatural for moms to be separated from their babies um, in this way. And if you're trained through DONA and have done a lot of community births, getting to go back and see your mom, you know, that mom after you've delivered, after she's delivered, and be with your client is really a positive experience. Um, this is really emotionally difficult for those women and the doulas. So as we think, um, we have expanded really in the last couple of years, and as we think about sort of next steps, I want to tell you kind of where we've been and where we're going in just the last few minutes here. So in the summer of 2012, we undertook a jail needs assessment. We were hearing from the women in the correctional facility, you got to go to the jail. So the women in the prison were saying, listen, what you're doing here is great for us, um, but I was in county jail, and it's awful there. You've got to go to the county jails. And we knew um, that there were women who were coming from county jails who had had pretty horrifying experiences but we also really had no idea what was happening in the county jails. And so we started in the metro area and started going around to the kind of the core inner ring suburb uh, counties. 
And we did these semi-structured interviews with jail administrators in these six counties. And really our goals were to identify current policies and practices, as well as any existing programs and services affecting this population of women and sort of to assess their perspectives of unmet needs and barriers to services for incarcerated women. And this was really challenging because I'll tell you, we walked into every single one of these interviews and we just wanted to sort of have sit downs with them. And they would say to us time and time again, you know, this really is a population that is complex and hard to serve. We don't have any resources for them and we don't, we don't really know what to do with them. So sometimes we give them an extra pillow, maybe they'll get an extra meal, but there were clearly no set policies for dealing with these women. Um, and on more than one occasion, we would hear, oh, we got a pregnant lady here now, would you go meet with her? And it was like, well, what would, other, what would she be getting otherwise, right? Just because we've showed up to ask you about your services, now we're gonna go talk to her? It, it was really challenging. And clearly what we heard from these jail administrators was that they recognized that this population had unique needs, but they really had had no training, they had no, the, the, the resources weren't there in the facility, and they didn't really know what to do this population of women. And what we heard multiple times was that they had pregnant women coming in and out of the facilities, but they had no births. And the first time we heard this, I remember distinctly which jail we were in, and I remember Erica and I looked across the table at each other, and we thought, that doesn't make any sense. And I, kind of gently clarified and I said, can you tell me more about that? So you're having pregnant women come through your facility but you don't have any births, how's that happening? And they said, oh, well we just release them. And I said, tell me more about that. So what's happening? Well, we can't afford to have those deliveries on our budget and so we just call a judge and get them out. I said, well, where do they go? I don't know, but that's not our problem anymore. And I just had this moment of like, I got where they were coming from, from a financial standpoint. I really truly did, but they were coming very much at a corrections administration lens. And I was coming at this like public health lens and where was the continuity of care? Where was she going? What was happening with these women as they were being released? And we realized that there was just this tremendous gap in services for these women. And really what was happening was women might get all the way up until their eighth or ninth month of pregnancy, and they would literally call a judge and say, okay, we've got to get Miss Smith out of here, and maybe she'll come back and finish her sentence when her baby is three months old. Maybe she'll deliver her baby and the next week she needs to come back and finish her sentence. Um, I interviewed a woman recently who talked about the judge, she was charged um, and was actually sentenced two years after her, her um, conviction. And she was, so this was two years later, she was gonna be uh, sentenced to do some jail time. And the judge, by the time she went to be sentenced, she was pregnant. And the judge said, well, you know, I've got to consider this. And her, her lawyer was really advocating for her to go home on electronic home monitoring. The judge said, well, you know what we're going to do? We're going to make you serve the first part of your sentence now during your pregnancy. I'll let you out when you're just before your due date. So about eight and a half months pregnant, I'll let you out. And when your baby is one, you've got to come back and finish the last six months of your sentence. And on one hand, right, it's like the judge has acknowledged that she's pregnant and wants her to be in the community and have those first six months with her baby, and yet on the other hand has totally missed everything we know about attachment and bonding and separation, right? So it's not just educating jail administrators, it's educating judges too and the whole criminal justice system about the unique needs of this population. So those needs assessments led us to expand our program um, into what in the last couple of years has been um, Hennepin and Ramsey County, so the counties that serve uh, Minneapolis and St. Paul. And we have encountered some interesting challenges in expanding the program to a jail setting. Um, there are obviously complexities and differences in the process, whether that be security or training or getting our staff um, you know, badges, et cetera, all of that has taken a lot of time. Um, there are also some really complex maternal risks uh, that are over and above what we had seen at the prison. Um, so there is some sense of stability that the women in our prison have come to, right? They're there long enough. They also have some sense of uh, sort of resolution with where they're at in this incarceration and know they're gonna be there for however long they've been sentenced. 
that doesn't seem to be the same sentiment with our women who are coming in and out of the jails. Some of that is, uh, you know, I'm getting out of here the next day, don't talk to me, or I don't need to be here, uh, these charges are going to get dropped, X, Y, and Z. You know, these women are not in the same place thinking about their incarcerations as the women we're seeing in the prison. Many of our women are actively returning to dangerous lifestyles, actively using, actively engaged in prostitution. Um, homeless. And this is a really difficult challenge when you think about how do you serve this population of women. The group format has been really challenging to implement, not impossible, um, but different in uh, the jail setting where so much of what we've seen, again, anecdotally, is creating that environment in which those moms feel supported by each other at the prison. And so much of their support is coming from their peers, right? What that experience is like. Our facilitators can't say to them, this is what it felt like for me when I came back and was separated from my baby. But another mom can. And so in the group format in the jails, when the turnover is as fast as it is, and that group of women is not as consistent, it's presented a lot of challenges in thinking about how the peer support looks in that setting. Um, and then the doula support looks different in particular because now these women are delivering in the community, right? But they're delivering in a community in potentially a very high risk um, setting. And so our community-based doulas are challenged to think about where that mom goes and helping follow that mom, assuming she wants to stay and re continue receiving services. Um, and so that presents some interesting challenges as well. So we've expanded the program. We, like I said, we started at Shakopee. We've since expanded to the two county jails. And last year, it was really now about the time we were doing these um, key informant interviews with the jails, we were really noticing some just major gaps in care for pregnant women and some some places where we felt like, you know what, there's a lot of education and advocacy that can be done around this area. And so what happened uh, was it was the last legislative session. Uh, we were working, we had had some informal conversations. Erica was at a grantee meeting and actually ran into, she was very, very pregnant at the time, and ran into a state representative. And Erica was talking about our program and the uh, legislator said, you've got to get something on the books about this. We've got to put in a bill. And Erica, I remember her calling me saying like, we're not ready for that, are we? And I thought, no, we're not ready for that. Like, I don't know about you, but I don't have any legislative advocacy training. Like, where are we going to begin, right? And we started having these conversations um, with the Children's Defense Fund and the Better Birth Coalition, some grassroots advocacy organizations and some lobbying organizations, um, just to think about what was the current state of our legislation. And at the time, you heard in the video, uh, the Minnesota Correctional Facility wasn't restraining women, uh, pregnant women, but as soon as that status changed uh, and they were no longer pregnant, so after the baby was born, they could be restrained. Um, and they were restrained in that postpartum transport. They were restrained. They could be restrained during transport. And there was nothing that prevented a woman from being in full shackles legally. Um, and we knew that there was a lot that had been written and there were many other states that had followed that would be good models to at least put some legislation um, out there about the use of restraints. But in looking at many of the other things that were happening around the country on some of these anti-shackling bills, we also realized that there were some basic things that we had heard from the women at Shakopee and the women in our county jails about lack of pregnancy testing, lack of standards for prenatal care and education, and so we really wanted to take the bill more than just providing, you know, legal elements around anti-shackling anti pieces. We really wanted to put in some additional elements that would make it more comprehensive than any other state bill that's out there. Um, and so one of the elements that we put in that was really critical was the pregnancy testing piece, um, that women who were coming into county jails, all facilities were um, being pregnancy tested. They could, of course, opt out. Um, but what was happening was that we were finding that the jails were saying, well, you know, we don't really know how long they're going to be here. They could be here a few days. They could be here a few months. We don't really want to know, because if we pregnancy test them, then we have to provide care for them. And what was happening was they, we were having women who were sitting in county jails who were showing up, you know, after they were sentenced to the commissioner of corrections, they were showing up to the correctional facility, to the prison, and they might have been three or four or five months pregnant having no care up to that point, despite the fact that they were sitting in a facility where they otherwise could have been receiving care. Um, so I was thinking about that this morning as we were talking about health care in your class, Julie, about foregone care and uh, that setting, which really is a challenge. 
And so we added that element and we also added some elements about prenatal care and education. One of the key things that I think we did, and I'm excited about the way we did it, uh, the Department of Corrections was on board with this legislation when it was introduced, but the Minnesota Sheriff's Association was very much not. Um, we have 87 counties in Minnesota and 84 county jails, and they all do things a little bit differently. And there is a little bit of a, don't tell me how to do my job, right? The state isn't gonna tell me, sheriff of Polk County, how I'm supposed to run my jail. It's my jail, it's my problem, I'm gonna run it the way I wanna run it. Um, and so there was a lot of contention with this bill getting introduced last, last session, and so our compromise was to add this legislative advisory committee to the legislative language. Um, and the legislative advisory committee was really tasked with um, bringing together a diverse group of key stakeholders to identify the critical issues addressing this population and to come up with some future recommendations to um, the legislature. Uh, a representative from the Department of Pediatrics at the University of Minnesota was named in the legislation. I remember when I saw the final bill language come through and I thought, I should probably clue my department chair into the fact that like I just got a bigger job. Um, and a very complicated one, right? So I had said, right, never done any legislative advocacy, had done a lot of reading on translating research to policy, but really had no experience in bringing potentially a, a contentious group of key stakeholders together to try to come up with some compromise. But I have to say it was probably one of the most fulfilling career experiences I have had to date. That first meeting was a little tense about where did this bill come from and why are you telling us how to run our jail? And as we got to a point that it was like, I didn't, I'm not telling you how to run this jail. Let's talk about what we wanna do for this population of women though. Let's acknowledge that there is a problem um, and that the absence of a lawsuit doesn't mean that we don't have a problem with the way we're treating these women. We were able to really get to a place where we thought about how could we improve care? How could we be better collaborating with our county public health departments? How could we be making sure that women are accessing resources in the community that we know exist? Um, and so the advisory committee was a really fabulous opportunity. Out of that advisory committee, we were able to put together an inter interdisciplinary institute on the reproductive health of incarcerated women last October. We were really excited to bring in um, a couple of national speakers. So Jeanette Burst, who has done some work in this area, Danielle Dallaire, colleagues of ours at uh, the College of William and Mary, who's doing work with women in jails, um, and Mary Byrne, who's done uh, the seminal research on prison nurseries. And so we really talked about sort of preconception, prenatal, and postpartum care for pregnant women and had about 100 people from very different backgrounds and professions join us for that day. Um, and then also put together, and I brought several copies, an entire issue um, published by the Center for Leadership in Maternal and Child Health at our University of Minnesota School of Public Health, an entire issue in Healthy Generations about incarceration and public health, um, which has now been disseminated very, very widely and is an exciting opportunity to sort of educate and inform and think about where are there gaps in research and what do we know. So I'm gonna wrap with just telling you our next steps and then thinking about kind of taking some questions if you guys uh, have them. We, as I said, we've had ongoing implementation and we're evaluating every step of the way. We're looking to expand to county jails. Part of the legislation that was passed last year um, provided women with access, incarcerated women with access to doulas. Now it's on us to figure out how we create a network of doulas across the state for that woman in Bemidji who wants a doula. Um, we are consulting on implementation in other states. We have gotten a lot of phone calls, including um, from some Congress people about what's happening in Minnesota. How did you guys get that process? How did you have a collaborative group and what's that looking like? Um, and how is it moving forward? And then as I said, our legislative advisory committee made recommendations out of that group that were put forth in January of this year and we'll be testifying, um, the bill will be introduced actually on Tuesday. So we'll have another round of what I think is a better bill than what got introduced last year as in really in large part because of the collaborative process that brought a group of diverse stakeholders together to have some tough conversations about a critical issue. So I will stop there. That'll leave about 20 minutes for questions, right? If, we'll go from there. Thank you. You guys are a great audience.